will start. Uh, okay. So to tackle the concept of navigating research, which is the focus of our work these days, we would like to introduce an institution that is essentially conceptual, but also has an intermittently physical presence. It is perhaps more a changing form structure than an institution, one that allows us to think and to practice knowledge and share art through the notion of a museum. The institution in question is called the Museum of the Contemporary, or MOFC for short. It was established in 2012 by the Salamanca Group. Comprising Lia Mawas, she was already introduced. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you can say anyway. Uh, okay, uh, yes. Artist uh, curator and co-founder director of the Mamuta Art and Research Center in Jerusalem and current PhD candidate at Queen's University. And Diego Rotman, who also was introduced, but anyway, artist curator <laughs> co-founder of Mamuta and currently the head of the Department of Theater Studies at the Hebrew University. Both were introduced by Professor <laughs> Susan Love very nicely a couple of minutes ago. To borrow a uh, Nora Sternfeld concept, the MOFT may be defined as a paramuseum, namely an institution that seeks as one of its primary objectives to tackle museological questions. It does this through its rhetoric and through its approach to exhibitions and programs notions of collections and storage, replica and original, ownership, colonialism, democratization, collecting, curating, and so forth. By museum, we mean a fragile structure for sharing art, knowledge, meeting, and performing. Another key topic is how the mosque relates to its physical venue, the building, the neighborhood, the land. Unlike a traditional museum, which, which is usually a cultural and architectural icon, a symbolic landmark, a place of peregrination, the mosque is in a constant state of creation and dismantling. It appears as and when needed and hosts where possible. It belongs to a tradition of wandering and adaptability. The mosque appeared for the first time in 2012, hosted by the Mamuta Art and Research Center when it was based in Enkarem a Palestinian village whose inhabitants fled or were expelled in 1948 during Israel's War of Independence, or Nakba, the catastrophe, as it is known by Palestinian. Today, it's a gentrified tourist site inhabited mostly by Jewish people. Enkarem is also the fourth most important pilgrimage site in the Christian world, as it is where, according to the tradition, Elizabeth and Mary met. The MOF was inaugurated with an exhibition that dealt critically with the history of Enkarem, its current urban politics and the history of the state in which it was housed, which had formerly belonged to an Arab family. The exhibition exposed snippets of an independent research made by us that had been conducted on the history of the state, revealing that it had previously belonged to the Palestinian scholar Issa Manun. The house was expropriated by the State of Israel in 1948 and bought in 1972 by the Jewish Israeli Polish artist and Holocaust survivor Daniela Passal, who requested in her will that the house serve as an art center. The MOFC has positioned itself rhetorically and symbolically in relation to the controversial local history and the national museums and memorial institutions. Based in the Valley of Enkarem, it invites a relation with the Mount Herzl Memorial, as the curatorial text points out. If Mount Herzl is the mountain of remembrance or the mountain of Zionist historical consciousness, by way of the line stretching between Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum, and the Israel's National and Military Cemetery, then, in the topography of Israeli remembrance, Enkarem is the valley of oblivion, or the valley of Zionist historical subconscious. The Museum of the Contemporary constitutes a new point on the map of institutions of Israeli consciousness, illustrating its three-dimensional triangle. Thus, the MOFC is primarily a, rhetoric, a rhetorical structure, at least in this first project a statement set in opposition to hegemonic memorials that stresses the oblivion that is the erasure of the Palestinian history of the Enkarem village. 
The MOF is referring to the actual existence of Jewish and Israeli art institutions embedded in a Palestinian house or village, a phenomenon that has occurred as elsewhere in Israel, most notably the artist village in Ein Hod, and in another way, the Israel Museum itself. Thus, rhetorically, the mosque underlines its function in relation to the Israel Museum. And we quote from the catalog of the Museum of the Contemporary. If according to Mansfeld architectural plan, the Israel Museum structure was inspired by an Arab village and built on the ruins of the village of Sheikh Bader, Palestinian village of Sheikh Bader, and the Museum of the Contemporary is in itself an Arab house in a village that has become a memorial museum of an Arab village, it follows that the Israel Museum is a souvenir of the Museum of the Contemporary. Thus, the mosque began as a critical tool to other art structures and institutions, rhetorically and through visual art projects and performance and collaborations with other nonprofits that we don't have time, unfortunately, to share in the frame of this presentation. The mosque had to live in Karen because of the critical political approach of our practice. The mosque relocated in 2000. 13 in the former leper's home in Jerusalem, which was funded in 1887 by a German Protestant church. Besides a series of works about the former Jerusalem leprosarium, the mosque developed a series of projects on the intersection of Jewish folklore, contemporary art, and the local fraud reality. Uh, so this is the this Jesus is the, Hilfe, yeah. that's the former leprosarium. Um, and this is a book also that's part of the practice of the Museum of the Contemporary that uh, we had a, a edited in English also with the help of a Queen's University, a Cultural Studies and a, a Jewish Studies, a, and it was a, a pu a published by the Reuters. This a, is a couple a, of months ago. And it's yeah. open, like it's completely <laughs> open if you scan the open barcode open access, it's everything there. Okay, so coming back. Yeah. yeah. So, focusing on the MOFT's last exhibition that was digitized, we shall refer to its content and then introduce the concept of navigating research. The name of the exhibition is Permanent Residency, featuring works produced by the Salamanca Group, that us, in collaboration with Adi Kaplan and Shahar Carmel, Ktura Manor, and Brian Hold. The exhibition de dealt with acquisition, dismantling, assembling, transportation, replication, and exhibition of the temporary homes or dwelling with the idea of temporary homeland, migration, and forced migration, themes that we had dealt with in previous projects. The permanent, ex the permanent residency exhibition began with a short film that documented a garage sale that we held at the Kfar Saba City Art Gallery before leaving to Kingston for a year. Uh, we were selling then our personal objects, exploring the link between economy, art, and life, with the gallery serving as our garage. A second work was directly related to the house we rented in Kingston, the only furnished house we could find at that time. The Sobermans, own owners of the house, had died in the early 2010s, and their children had put the home up for long-term rental as is a kind of family museum with the 1960s decor just as their parents had left it. We lived in the house for a year inside the set of another family. The Sobermans, Please. Yeah, thank you. The Sobermans <laughs> art collection comprised over 40 paintings, mostly reproductions of well-known artworks and some originals by non-canonical ones. It was clear to us that we were living in a Canadian branch of the Museum of the Contemporary. So we opened the house, as Susan was telling before, during our stay, for a series of cultural activities in the living room. A year and a half when we were back in Israel, we commissioned Adi Kaplan and Shahar Carmel to paint the reproductions that were at the living room of the Soberman family. So in that way, doing new originals by Adi and Kaplan, and they painted them down to their frames. The installation was reproduced, was reproduced in the Soberman's family living room. And the installation also includes a piano, which our daughter practiced on occasionally. 
In the backyard of the Sovereign House during our stay there, we built a sukkah. A sukkah or sukkot in plural are the temporary shelters that the Israelites erected during their wanderings in the Sinai Desert during the exodus of Egypt, and which have been put up every year ever since in the form of a temporary huts topped by palm fronds or other foliage so that the roof is partly open to the sky on the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, fulfilling the commandment to, and I quote, live in tabernacles for seven days. In 2006, we began creating Sukkot. Their function varied to suit the different processes of transformation and translocation by, by altering their status, identity, their symbolic or economic value, their meaning, and of course, their biography. The Sukkot are structures that are left plain on the outside, while in the interior walls host diverse artworks and paraphernalia that allude to Jerusalem, to the local setting, and to the Israelites' wanderings in the desert. When you enter a sukkah, you are symbolically transported to another time and place, quality that are closely related to our interest in the virtual platform of a museum. Our sukkot were created as a ritual structure, an art object, an ethnographic or museological object, or a combination thereof. The structures of these temporary homes deal not only with aspects of the holiday, tradition or the religious commandment, but also with aspects that lay beyond them, contemporary Israeli ethnopolitics, the status of Bedouin as refugees, the blurring of boundaries between art and life, the wandering and smuggling of symbolic homes, the status of a double as a new original, the performative transformation of the structure's identity, and the transformation of the structure's status and its market and cultural value. Contrary to the custom of dismantling the sukkah after the end of the seven days holiday, we left our sukkah in Kingston standing throughout the entire year, exposed to the extreme change in weather. At, can we see? At the end of the winter, we invited Canadian painter Brian Hode to paint the snowy landscape on the walls of the sukkah to commemorate the frozen Lake Ontario on the wall traditionally designated for an image of Jerusalem. Knowing we would have to return to Jerusalem and we and will be longing the lake. We also commemorated the Soberman House and as, as and our presence as temporary guests in the landscape covered by the snow. The sukkah was dismantled smuggled as a gazebo in order not to pay insurance and taxes and installed as an artwork in Jerusalem, alongside the source of its inspiration, a replica of the German Deller Sukkah. The original Deller Sukkah, dated 1840, was dismantled during the Nazi times in Germany and smuggled out as lumber and installed as an ethnographic object at the Judaica collection of the Israel Museum. The replica created by us in 2017 is an artwork instead of an ethnographic object and was almost identical to, other, to the original, but with some slight changes following a research trip we did to Germany. The paintings on the walls of the sukkah were subtly transformed to change the depicted environment. And just one, this is our uh, trip. Yes, also to Germany, and just one small example that we discover also after that with the help of the curator of the Judaica department in the Israel Museum okay. that, uh, okay, no, not to enter that, yeah, yeah. okay. No, that we, <laughs> we, no, we were traveling to Germany, we were in front of the, of the Deller House and we discovered actually the church was not painted in the sukkah, it doesn't appear, that was very strange for us. So we invited the curator of the Israel Museum and we were telling her that actually a church was supposed to be there in the sukkah. She said, okay, I was not there, but I know about that because when we were doing the restoration a couple of years ago, we discovered that actually a church was painted there, but was erased. So she sent us those pictures of the restoration process and we put back the church in the sukkah. So the replica in one way is also a, an updated version that is uh, actually described in the original sukkah, but it is closer to the original than the original itself. 
Another video work in the exhibition documents glimpses of day-to-day -day li family life in Kingston, our children's cultural acclimat acclimatization, building the Sukkah structure, and our thoughts on migration and belonging. Another work exhibited was a documentary film about the eternal Sukkah, in another project we did about Sukkot in collaboration with the al Korshan family of the Jalim Bedmin tribe that addressed their situation as refugees and the issue of displacement of Arab inhabitants in the sea zone of the occupied territories. The permanent residency exhibition was held during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we, 3D, we were not very original, of course, we 3D modeled it so that the local international visitors could view it virtually in case of lockdown. However, the exhibition continued to be open uh, to be open throughout most of the pandemic and the virtual version of the museum was archived and never used. A few months ago, while exploring the archived exhibition, we thought about other potential uses for that archived digital structure to become research territory. It might, we thought, enable a new approach to knowledge production and sharing in the academic fields, as well as new possibilities for museological practices. Accordingly, we understand the architectural digital model as a structure for navigating knowledge for a multi-layered perspective that include besides and along the navigating spatial possibilities, access to scholarship, video essays and archival materials. Some of, some of the thoughts we are perhaps that we are having are not new at all, but are among the possible results of being lost in the exploration of an abandoned exhibit Losing, losing one's way while navigating is where we may find the seeds for a new intellectual and academic adventure. This museum is a book, a cinema, an archive that are dramic, dramaturgically influenced by the poetics and mechanics of immersive theatre, site-specific art and gaming. All those tools may allow us to imagine a fully immersive territory of research where teams composed by artists, scholars, designers, community members, etc., depending the project, script the territory, inviting visitors to experience a different type of agency in a particular intellectual and aesthetic adventure, one that is not currently being practiced and knowledge or recognized as such in many academic institutions. We are interested in how the museum's dramaturgy and the mechanism of the navigation and gaming might raise new questions about scholarship. This is similar perhaps to Gina Bloom's notion of knowing through play as a historiographical method as developed in her book Gaming the Stage, where she proposes to imagine the theater historian, and I quote, as a gamer who engages her body and embodied mind in the act of playing with the past. End of quote. We want to propose an approach whereby research results are represented dramaturgically. We know that, these are, that there are many approaches in research creation that allow for similar ways of sharing knowledge, but can we make the navigations a recognizable form of publication? This performative and museological approach to what is that? art. To art. Yes, to art and scholarship is, of course, closely related to gaming practices. We think of our museum as a scholarship territory that might recall alternative games such as the walking simulators, games that invite the player to explore largely abandoned or ruined games worlds, for instance, empty houses and remote islands. The virtual morph as games allows different temporalities to play out simultaneously. We are interested in thinking about a scholarship through practices such as dramaturgy, cura curation, and walking. The most sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, to film on. Yes, thank you. You can talk. Thank you, Diego. <laughs> the MOF in its 3D virtual version becomes an academic playground for sharing knowledge, one where the visitor has has freedom of time, the freedom to recognize their findings, to write on walls, to recurate, and perhaps to meet other visitor readers who have come to learn, read, watch together. We are, inter we are interested in understanding if the way we approach knowledge can be staged and experienced. We are aware that this structure may be hacked, attacked, but it is this very vulner vulnerability, this ephemerality, that is one of its most seductive characteristics. The virtual MOF becomes the, then, not a documentation and neither come in place of a book about it, but becomes in this format a different way to approach in knowledge, a structure that, 
as with the sukkah, combines representation and the spatial experience of being here and elsewhere at the same time. This is the end of our presentation. Uh, um, yeah, we just want to say that these are thoughts on what this platform can be, not as being documentation of, uh, but being a tool for research. It's not something that we have developly developed technically. So those are only examples of of how this could work, but inside and virtually, like a research that people could walk inside. We can start again. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>